Nightingale. I'm Kimberly Nightingale, Executive Director of the St. Paul Almanac, and I want to invite, invite you and welcome you to tonight's Lower Town Reading Jam. Um, it's hosted by the St. Paul Almanac, and we do a lot of things around town. We do a open mic at Golden Time Coffee Shop. We do these readings every month, and we publish a book. It's the St. Paul Almanac each year. This year, we're working on our eighth book. So if you're interested in reading and writing, check out our website. There uh, might be a story in your heart or in your mind that you'd like to show to the rest of the world, and it might be best uh, illus illustrated in the St. Paul Almanac. So check out our submission guidelines, and we'd be interested in having your work published in our book. I want to give a big shout out to the Black Dog Cafe. Yeah. Yeah. This is the fourth year that the Black Dog has been sponsoring uh, the Lower Town Reading Jams. And uh, mm -hmm. please encourage, we, uh, we really encourage you to buy food, enjoy drinks, and keep the Black Dog um, thriving. It's been a really difficult two years with the, lower, the light rail coming down here in Lower Town. I just want to tell you a little bit about the St. Paul Almanac. We're a literary organization, and we create opportunities for understanding, learning, and building relationships through sharing people's stories. And we'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, this activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation and support from the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. SPNN airs our shows through the month on their cable access channel. We'd also like to give a big shout out to Takuma Aiken, our incredible artist who draws the action as it is happening. And you can watch Takuma right here while he's drawing. Tonight's show is titled Nuevo, Nuevo Mestizos, and our curator tonight is Luis Alamayehu. Luis Alamayehu is a writer, educator, administrator, poet, father, grandfather, performer, and activist of African and Native American heritage. Luis is a co-founder of the Native Arts Circle the oldest Native American artist organization in the Upper Midwest. In 2003, the Headwaters Foundation gave Lewis an award of, for lifelong commitment to social justice. Currently, Alamayu's work focuses on teaching, writing, performance, mentorship, community organizing, charter schools, and organizational development. Samples of his Ancestor Energy CD, All Wear, can be heard online at cdbaby.com. Today, Lewis works deeply across multiple cultural communities. Alamayu is the director of the poetry jazz ensemble Ancestor Energy and is the winner of an Urban Griot Award in 2009. Please welcome Lewis Alamayu. I'm going to turn it over to my brother, Leo Lara.
poems, songs, and stories are the synthesis and manifestation of our dream and physical worlds. As I am the product of many people, places, and experiences, likewise, these expressions These poems are a reflection of science and the truth of mythology. These poems jump with juju, float on prayers of sage and sweet grass, remember Zion and the rugged cross, look eastward to Islam, peace. Dance with Krishna, bop with Buddha, and sing E equal MC square, more or less. These poems have seen red moons rise over the pyramids of ancient Egypt and Maya lands. These poems know that not only are the pyramids still standing, but equally yet still falling and feel humbled and blessed in the vastness of the universe. These poems have suckled in an afro karma woman's breast, known the tenderness of a father's rough and red-brown earth hands. These poems have been scorched by the fire of an Ethiopian woman's eyes, healed by an Afro sister's aloe love, shocked by the firstborn sweet thunder, learned the Borinqua blues, and had vision renewed by then Lucia. These poems have danced on a bridge called Tomorrow while the music of a youth sang in this old one's ears, witness to the dawn. These poems dance on a bridge called Tomorrow while the music of youth sing, 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 witness to the dawn. These poems have known the cultural, political, and spiritual zombies that move amongst us every day causing confusion and death, and I am not afraid. These poems know the tyranny of silence and scream. These poems believe that the creator will gather all those who are scattered, not knowing that earth is home, earth is home. Believe that after much struggle, storm, and wisdom hard won, the meek will inherit this same earth transformed. These poems mourn and celebrate. These poems have their feet on a road moving toward tomorrow, seeking only the peace of oneness. These poems, stories, songs, Sing for you. Welcome. Good evening. I wrote that a long time ago. And probably a good 30 years ago. And it feels like I really didn't know what I was writing at the time. Um, there's a whole lot of ways I don't really feel like I'm a writer, like most writers are writers that have this discipline of sitting down in the morning or the evening and writing, writing, writing. I pretty much wait on the spirit to talk to me. And if the spirits don't talk to me, I don't necessarily write a poem. I might write other things. Um, one of my mentors was a guy named Hakim Adabudi, uh, whom I met when I returned to Chicago after living here for quite a while. I came to Minnesota to go to college, and in retrospect, all of that seems very different than it seemed to me at the time. But uh, I went from the south side of Chicago uh, an African-American community. I really did grow up in a community. I had other parents, other aunts and uncles, other sisters, brothers, cousins that I was deeply related to. And it took me a long time to figure out that 
that practice of extended family was something very African. And over time, I began to discover as I met more and more people here that it was also a very Mexican thing. It was a very Somali thing, an Ethiopian thing. I mean, uh, a rural German, Norwegian kind of thing. You know, like everybody had some form of this. And I also began to understand that modern Western world was in complete opposition to that kind of relationship amongst people. Because I grew up in that on the south side of Chicago, when I eventually moved to the Twin Cities, my survival strategy was to build an extended family, to build a community. And because of the makeup of that, my extended family began to be this incredible mix of people that I discovered I had some kind of heart connection to. And some of you are here. <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> yes, you do. So um, I want to jump to why I came up with this guy, this idea of mestizos. Uh, what did I say, mestizos? Yeah, that. Um, it was partially because I read a book I think it was in the 80s called uh, Borderlands, or La Frontera. And uh, it was written by a woman named Gloria Anzaldúa. And reading this book really began to give me uh, a way to, uh, what? Understand the life I had been living. This book was very important, and also a woman named, uh, oh, my poor memory, uh, Levens Morales, Aurora. Aurora. Yeah, she wrote a book with her mother uh, back in the 80s, and her talking about being Jewish and being Puerto Rican and all the levels of what it means to be Puerto Rican, I was like identifying with that. It like made sense to me. Also, the experiences that I had meeting Amos Owen at the Prairie Island Reservation and being brought into ceremonies and being taught by him by a good seven years, a lot of things began to fall into place. I actually began to, I had an opportunity to meet Gloria at a queer studies conference in 1993 that was held at University of Iowa in Iowa City. And uh, I had just gotten a grant from St. Paul Companies uh, as a community-based artist. And I was trying to figure out what do I need to do in order to make best advantage of this year and that was one of the things that came up because it just seemed to me really important to like digest that because I had already been reading um, feminist writings by feminists of color and they seemed to be to me the most radical folks at the time, maybe still, because it seems like they had a lot more reason to break out of bounds and I've had a really good relationship with a lot of progressive women. Um, Miradel Lassour was a mentor. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks was a mentor. Um, other women, and I've actually been invited to, from time to time, women's ceremonies. And kind of asked to hold a certain kind of place. So, um, I don't know why this happened, but it happened. And so I feel like I need to be responsible for the people, to the people that gave to me. Like all the ancestors that came before, I think they knew that we were coming and they suffered through a lot so that we could be here, so that I could be here. 
and I feel a real responsibility to keep giving, sustain myself, but also figure out how to keep giving. I'm going to ask someone who I've had a real heart connection to for a long, long time to just say uh, a little bit about why Gloria Anzaldúa is important. And I really want to encourage people to buy her book and digest it because we're at a point in history where the, some of the wisdom in this book needs to be translated, especially if we're men, so that we understand the essence of what she's saying and can really begin to deal with the tsunami of change that is coming our way right now. And we've got to realize that we're relatives and that all the various paradigms that we've been exposed to, there's a way to assimilate all of that into something new and whole and life-giving and life-sustaining. Okay. So, Lupe, Lupe Morales, would you please just share a little bit? Hello, welcome. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. And I wanna say that I'm very happy and proud because you are in for a treat. The artists here um, are more than artists, they're familia. They build community and um, if you haven't heard them before, it's gonna be life altering. If you have heard them before, it's going to be life altering. <laughs> because you will take away tonight um, what your heart so desires. For me, Gloria Anzaldúa was, um, I've met her a couple times when she planted her feet here on this earth before she went to the other side. She was before her time. That's why to me she is an amazing, amazing woman. And it wasn't that she wasn't afraid. I'd like to say that she did everything that she did because she wasn't afraid. There was times that she was afraid. But she was more afraid of not living her truth. And Gloria was one of the, my first loves from afar, of course, at that time. And she knows very well now. Um, and I just want to honor her and welcome this space and welcome her. Um, to this space. And so I am going to defer from the request because as a friend, as someone with a heart connection, we, um, we do what our friends would like us that is healthy and builds community. I am going to turn it over to an incredible young woman that I think is wonderfully gifted and talented and I'm very honored to um, become knowing her, and you will too, as um, she speaks. But for Gloria, <sighs> Guadalupe Tonansi, ese madre mía, Guadalupe Tonansi, ese madre mía. Jometeo. Jessica, would you please share your life of Gloria with us tonight? Gracias, mujer. Te quiero tanto. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> I'm a lot taller. I was not prepared to do this, but when a comadre asks, you do what you're asked. So, uh, Gloria Anzaldúa, for those of you, just a brief bio, was born in 1942 in the Central Valley of Texas. She was born near the borderland, and so for her, geographical space was always very important. She later moved to Santa Cruz, and when she was in Santa Cruz, she would always walk along the oceans when she was getting her PhD at the university there. And so land was something that always nourished her. And I think that's what we see tonight with the drum, which is you know, a remembrance of animal, of tree, of life. Land becomes important. So in this book that Lewis mentioned, Anzaldúa writes about this idea of borderlands, where she's talking about two different types of borderlands, a geographical space, the actual physical border, which she says is a 1,300 mile long wound, a bleeding wound that divides our countries 
She also talks about it as a physical space. So she says that we come out of this state of qualiqua, this terrible space. If you've ever been in a place of depression, of darkness, you go through qualiqua. And when you come out of qualiqua, you come to a new place, which she calls the mestiza consciousness. And when she wrote this book in the early 80s, it was for Chicanas, it was for queer women of color in particular to be adopting this type of consciousness, where we live in a constant state of um, what she calls nepandera, this in-between space. We are neither you know, Mexican enough, um, US white mainstream enough, so we're in this in-between land, this borderland. But later, when she died in 2004 from diabetes, she was coming to a new sense of writing, which she called spiritual activism. And in this spiritual activism, she says that all people, regardless of your ethnicity, your history, your heritage, can adopt this mestiza consciousness. And so that way, it becomes part of your physical being and also your philosophical being. So the last thing that I want to say, Gloria became very important because she also instituted this idea about our heritage, Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, Latinos, et cetera, that it incorporates African and Asian uh, lineages into our understanding of mestizo, which before was just Spanish, Indian. Uh, so she really asks us to look at a global perspective of what it means to be connected. So I think in relationship to the folks that we'll be seeing tonight, this idea of nuevo mestizo, meaning that there are no borders, that we don't rise above them as if they don't exist, but that with this type of consciousness, we can really build connections with people in a deep and heart-to-heart -heart felt way. So. If we all are Americans, if we all are Americans, we are all neighbors in family. We were not looking at boundaries in flex, rather as the helping each other and sharing what we have. We dance our dances and sing our songs as one people. If we all are Americans, we will all be equal, blacks, whites, mestizos, and Indians are indigenous. We be same and live in harmony and respect. Si somos americanos.
Emmanuel Ortiz. I think I'm the tallest one. So. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I don't know how I got invited to this lineup with Lewis and Leo, but um, it's really quite an honor. So, so thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I don't really know what it means to be mestizo. I'm just a red-blooded American boy. <laughs> God and country. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that came out of an experience I had about about eight, eight nine years ago. Uh, I had the opportunity to go down to Venezuela uh, as an international observer when the right wing was trying to oust Chavez. Um, Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, as many of you know, he's quite ill right now battling cancer. Um, this poem isn't necessarily about, about Chavez, but it's, it's about what I experienced traveling from, and it wasn't the first time I'd been to Latin America, but it, uh, what it, the experience of traveling to Latin America as a brown person and reflecting upon some experiences coming back. Um, a couple of sort of notes in here. Um, Chavez was quoted as saying that when he won this, this referendum to remain president, he was quoted as saying that he had hit a home run um, on, the, on the, the lawn of the White House. Uh, baseball is big in, in Venezuela. Um, they haven't figured out that soccer is the revolutionary sport of the people, apparently, but we forgive them for that. Um, I don't. Th other than that, the only other reference that may be somewhat obscure is that there is a Japanese restaurant in Minneapolis called Ichiban. So somehow that gets referenced in this poem. The poem is called Brown Unlike Me. In Venezuela, I watched as the people of the nation stood at the plate, swung out in defense of their president who won a democratic referendum by a majority of the majority unlike our own president that same year. In defense of Chavez, millions of hands upon a single bat so swing for the fences, un honron over the wall of the White House lawn. In Venezuela, as in Cuba, I am a junkie. I understand that. In Mexico, I'm lucky if I'm pocho, a gringao instead of a straight up gringo, because in these lands, the color of my passport is deeper than the color of my skin. Now, as I pass through Miami International Airport, international code MIA, I feel every letter of it, owning that I am made in America, but also feeling like part of me is missing in action. And somewhere on the journey home, if there is such a place, an invisible line is crossed. It may be at the point where sky meets earth, where earth meets sea, where skin meets sky. Somewhere in this sacred trinity, I don't know where, I cross a border. Two, three. I hand in my tuxedoed passport of first world citizen in exchange for my second skin of second class citizenship, the kind I wear like a favorite sweater, an old pair of tennis shoes that don't wear out no matter the miles I put on them. It ain't my Sunday best, just the only thing clean in the closet. Deep boarding the plane, I assume that here on US soil, I will be me again. I get to go back to being my complex, complete self and the white boy I'm traveling with who gave himself his own hip hop name, taken from a distant red planet and a local Japanese restaurant, he will be the same color of privilege. The man in the customs agent uniform resembles my uncle Carlos, enough to warrant a double take with that OG vato turned family man look complete with shaved head, goatee, tats, and work boots. And Carlos, the customs vato, tells all international travelers to divide into two lines, US citizens and foreigners.
And while nothing seems more foreign to me than a white guy with a Martian Japanese name, here I am standing with Mars Ichiban in the U.S. citizens line, because here and now the color of my passport is deeper than the color of my skin. And standing on the, in the other line of this instant and uneven divide are people who look to me like family, some darker, some lighter, some of African bloodlines, some of indigenous. Most are some mixture of something, children of colonization, occupation, enslavement, of melanin, miscegenation, migration, all of them brown, yet their passports make them unlike me. When I get to the customs desk and the agent asks me for my passport and do I have anything to declare, I want to say I have no passport to give you, America. It has been stolen for me over and over again. My name is Willie Brown Lohman, but you may call me Memo. I'm late for my night job as a busboy in a Japanese restaurant, so can I please go now? What's that? You don't believe me. OK, my name is Hugo Chavez, but you can call me Fidel. My purpose for going to Venezuela to watch a game of baseball. On my way home, I plan to stop in DC to get a ball off the White House lawn. These people on the other side, they're with me. Carlos, the customs vato, too. I can vouch for all of them, their family. And you can create all the lines you want cordon us off. You can impose and revoke citizenship, with the, wash the salt of the Caribbean Sea from our skin, the island sand from our hair. You can scold the trills from our tongues, criminalize our languages, anglicize our birth names, but I will not let you take from us our memory of family, home, language, blood, these we hide very well amongst the pages of our passports, the ones we keep just below the top layer of our skin, the only passport we will ever really need to know just who we are and where we come from. Uh, I'll do one more for you before I surrender the mic. So Lewis, when Lewis asked me, boy, this is what, like October, November? Yeah. To, to do this, he said January 23rd, and that seemed like eons in the future. And I said, well, if I don't have a, a, a football game that night, uh, I'll play. I'll, I'll do it. And he said, just say yes. So I said yes, and I have a football game that I missed tonight. So that's how much you know I respect Lewis. If I'm willing to miss a football game uh, to come and do this, you know I got a lot of respect for you. So um, speaking of sports, I don't know how many of you have. I mean, we all have sports heroes, probably, unless we like really don't like sports. Luis and maybe Saparicio. we. Who? Luis Lu I don't know who that is. <laughs> really? Aparicio. And he did what, or does what? Uh, he was on the championship team of the Chicago White Sox, 1959. He was not really. That's before my turn. <laughs> Number 11. All right. All right. Shor a shortstop for the Chicago Cubs? White Sox. White Sox. <laughs> well, my hero was Roberto Clemente. So he was also before my time, but I followed him later on. Um, when, the, when, the war, when we went back to war with Iraq, and not that we ever stopped being at war with Iraq, but in 2003, I remember watching ESPN or some sports program, and there was a, a very short piece about a young woman in, in New York in Manhattanville College, and her name was Tony Smith. Anybody ever hear of Tony Smith? Except for the fact that you've probably heard this poem before. Um, Tony Smith was a Division III basketball player at a school called Manhattanville College in New York. Uh, mixed race girl, black, uh, black, white, and Cherokee. 
when we went back to war uh, with Iraq, it was against, her conscience told her that she could not stand for the Pledge of Allegiance or for the, uh, for the national anthem before their basketball games. And so when the rest of the team stood up, she stood up with them, but she turned her back, she turned 180 degrees from the rest of her team. And this was her silent protest to not only the war in Iraq, but her understanding of, of, of United States sort of empire and history, um, as you'll see in, in this poem. She caught a lot of flack for that. Um, her teammates gave her flack. Um, opposing teams gave her flack. At one point, they, they played against, I think, a military academy, and the entire basketball court was lined with cadets who had flags. And an, at another point, a, a war veteran or an, a military veteran actually interrupted the game, stormed uh, the court, and got all up in her face uh, because she stood for what she believed in. And so because of that, and she never backed down. She didn't back down. So uh, Tony Smith becomes one of my sports uh, sheroes. And uh, for that, I wrote her a poem called Poem for Tony Smith, very creatively titled. It's all just a matter of degrees. And you went to college to get yours in sociology, turned your body 90 degrees, and so they gave you the third. Tried to turn a young woman's hoop dreams into a nightmare because you stood for what you believed in. Refused to salute a flag that symbolizes the enslavement and slaughter of our ancestors and their anonymous. The Middle Passage, the Trail of Tears, the wars on Iraq. This is not a story about an athlete in protest, but a nation in conflict with its own history, citizenry, and neighbors. And those who wanted a Patriot Act got one, not from the floor of Congress, but from a basketball gym. Those who wanted an army of one got one. And those who wanted this nation's youth to be all you can be got just what they were asking for in Tony Smith. You're a woman from Washington Heights who found basketball in the borderlands that buffer, that buffer between black and white, said your favorite artist is Lauren Hill. And the person you most admire is your mother. Well, Tony Smith, you are my shero. Because a shero is a woman who stands for what she believes in, even if it is 90 or 180 degrees from everybody else in the room. But we'll never see your figure silhouetted on a b-ball shoe, won't find your jersey on a footlocker display or sold on eBay. A red sleeveless with a beat with a, with a bold number 24 gripping the back and a big white M superwoman on the front with the team mascot splashed across it, reading Valiance. And I can't tell yet if it's ironic or appropriate that you're the only one on the team that that mascot fits. In the year of controversy, you served as the team's captain, averaged eight rebounds and 5.4 points a game, but you made your most important point even before the opening jump ball. In this game, it's not a matchup between this team and that, but between basketball and beliefs, because the national anthem before games is putting politics into sports. And I'll salute the Tony Smiths, along with the Deidre Chapmans, the Tommy Smiths, the, Carlos De the John Carloses, the Carlos Delgados, the Muhammad Ali's, the O'Donnell foils, these national treasures, long before I'll ever stand for old glory. Our beliefs, our histories, our futures, our heroes, our homes, there are some things we must stand for, some things we must not turn our backs on, but the stars and stripes is not one of these. So I hope that on a summer night, not unlike tonight, somewhere on an inner city court in Washington Heights, on a schoolyard playground in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, a young mixed race girl with a ball as big as her head 
and hoop dreams as big as the sky is skittering through a fistful of trash talking boys just before she pulls up, hits a fadeaway jumper from the baseline, and on her way down the court turns 90 degrees, turns one fingers to the heavens and proclaims Tony Smith, baby. Tony Smith. Thank you. La Cueca de la Libertad. Cueca is a rhythm from Chile, one of the many rhythms of South American countries. I personally am from Ecuador. Um, I started at a young age, 17 years old, learning about the sounds of the different uh, songs that have meaning in our lives. Mm. Songs about the struggles of the workers and the factories, the struggles of the campesinos and the countryside and the struggles of the people in the inner side and, and the cities and the students always the boys or the problems of the people and um, so i learned this kind of music uh, then i learned all the traditional sounds of all the instruments around the region of the andes so there was a way to understand what is regaining our own cultural roots against cultural invasion so La Boca de la Libertad is one of those songs which one of the uh, many, uh, many other groups from the Chilean movement, Nueva Canción, uh, has seen throughout the whole world. But in this case, my job has been just continue here, uh, carrying uh, those voices and uh, getting together in the settings like this, finding the way how to inter have uh, wine and Bridging our, our um, own struggles, our voices, and our cultures. And the song, La Cueca de la Libertad, is, talks about that couple poems which already has been said uh, tonight with uh, los compañeros poetas aquí. Cueca de la Libertad, Liberty of Dance. I enjoy life in my land, but I don't want to live in my country as if I were a stranger. I want the sea and the mountains, speaking my own tongue. And with liberty, life, as one deceives me, but while there is misery, there is no liberty of work. Caramba is an expression. There is no liberty without dignity. La Cueca de la Libertad.
Thank you, Leo. We need to admit that most of us were not acculturated to build community beyond whatever identity we were taught was ours. We tend to see the world through lenses of us and them, my country versus your country, my religion versus your religion, my football team versus your football team, rah-rah, bravery, manhood, patriotism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Loving our country, culture, class, neighborhood more than the earth that cradles all these locations, roots, is a profoundly false consciousness, a dangerous fairy tale view of reality, and we all fall down. The holy land is all the earth. Um, I'm thinking that in reflection upon what they were both singing about and talking about, this uh, last September I had the opportunity to reconnect with one of my older sister mentors, a woman named Bernice Regan, who was one of the founders of Sweet Honey in the Rock. Uh, I met her as a college student when one of my mentors, again, uh, a woman theologist ethicist named Eleanor Haney. Eleanor Haney, I'm afraid uh, her name might pass away, but she was a really incredible teacher to a lot of people at Concordia College in Moorhead and later out east uh, in Maine. Um, Eleanor somehow found out about Bernice, who was then a part of SNCC and the Freedom Singers which was a group of singers that used music as a way to inspire people to do what they were told they should not do on threat of death, on threat of losing their jobs, on threat of having their houses burned. And the freedom singers were an important part of the civil rights movement. And they used music at that time as a way to help people pull up the courage to do what the time was demanding of them. And the freedom movement and freedom songs have a lot in common with Nueve, Nuevo Cancion, the new song movement of South America, Latin America. Because we were taking traditional songs and rhythms and infusing them with the messages of revolution and transformation. And I think we're at a period of time when we need to like totally rethink what revolution means, because as Audre Lorde said, the tools of the master will never dismantle the master's house. And I think we're being brought to a time of needing to pull up tremendous courage because guns and bombs and gases pull us deeper into the paradigm that's destroying us. And we have to become somehow, I don't know the roadmap, we make the road by walking, as uh, Antonio Machado wrote long ago. Uh, it has to be something profoundly spiritual and profoundly courageous. Um, and I don't really know how to do that, but I'm trying to trust that as I take this breath and the next breath and the next breath, some wisdom will come through. Uh, I'm being reminded of a wisdom that came from my grandfather, which I think is really a universal wisdom. And it came to me in this form. One no matter what. If you looked into my grandfather's face, where all the times and trials had come to rest, into his eyes, you would see that all the world merges into one dream, one linking unity, like the earth, the sun, the righteous rain, one sacred fluidity, 
One perfect complex simplicity. One exquisite eternal movement unbelievably. One gorgeous movement of coming and going, coming and going. Moving slowly, slowly on this wheel of time, caked with a muddy love, carrying our one soul to a new birth. One more poem and we'll take a pause. Crazy eyes, no boundaries. I'm guilty. The best minds of my generation, despite that 1950s gloom, were, mul were ultimately the fiercest hearts stumbling out of Paradise Alley's womb. I'm talking about the precocious ones, crazy eyes, no boundaries, children of the sun, singing to the moon, African pulse, native heart, sunburned souls, screaming in the dark. Prophets and poets, they swang, they sang, they prophesied. There's something dangerous and delicious about exceeding the limits, breaking the boundaries, overflowing the banks. Something exhilarating, invigorating about melting down and running over, discarding the rules of given order. Being at peace about breaking the peace. Something downright gratifying, certainly satisfying about bleeding those definitions. How to describe what you see? Is it black, red, or white? Male or female? Animal, vegetable, mineral? Hey, is it day or night? It's all one in the spirit, don't you know? As above, so below. It's all one in the spirit. Cinema, verita, carnival, visionary, eternal caravan of creativity. Santa marijuana, holy peyote. Hey, ooh, ah, hey, ooh, ah, hey, ooh, ah. Dulululu la la la, como esta Miguel? Dulululu la la la, como esta Miguel? Dulululu la la la, dulululu la la, dulululu la la la. Some people have a hard time coming from Minneapolis to St. Paul. But Pluto is my footstool, and I'm stretching way, way out from here. Throw away your watches, and we're already flying through eternity. some refreshments. We'll be back. Ready or not, here we come.
Yeah. In Latin America, people actually risk their lives to sing songs with lyrics like that. Uh, Victor Jara and uh, somebody who did survive until old age took her was uh, Mercedes Sosa. There are times when she didn't know when she was singing on the stage if she would like literally be dragged off or shot. So it took courage to be a singer, to be an artist. Uh, I'd like to bring my dear nephew onto the stage to do something I asked him to do, like one of my favorite pieces, unless he's changed his mind. <laughs> I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to sneak two in if I can, so real quick. Uh, I'm using this iPad. I, like, I never touched the iPad till about a month ago or something like that, so. Uh, iPads, they didn't give me a free one. If they gave me one, I would've used it before then. In any case, um, real quick, I just wanna say something uh, about this, you know, sticking with this theme of sort of Nuevo Mestizo. I'm, it was less than a year ago now, although it's approaching a year, uh, it doesn't seem like that long ago, that Trayvon Martin was killed. Anybody remember Trayvon Martin? Young man who was killed uh, in uh, Florida. Um, he had committed no crime. He was uh, suspected by this, this guy named George Zimmerman of uh, acting suspicious and because he was in a neighborhood that didn't seem like it was his. Young African-American man. I think he was, what, 17 years old when he, was, when he was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. You know, and at first, the news, when the news first picked up on the story, when the media picked up on the story, George Zimmerman, they showed these pictures of him. He seemed like this, this basically, he seemed like a 20-something-year-old a, a white guy. It actually turns out that George Zimmerman is the child of a Peruvian immigrant uh, and a, 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 who is his mother, and his father is a magistrate of some sort. Um, very interesting to me. That was very interesting because, um, because of the complexity of that identity of, of that mixed race identity. Parents or the child of an immigrant. What I what I wonder so deeply in the time since then is what is his understanding of his own place uh, in this society and how he comes to see himself as being privy or privileged to certain spaces where this young man, George uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, is not, who, who would not be welcome in this community in which he was killed. Um, and what's, what is so fascinating to me about this in, in all of his tragedy and what gets lost, I think, in the conversation is that George Zimmerman represents the future of Latino identity, wherein the, the, it, the, it, the, the immigrant who come now in the last 20 years since I, I would say 1994 when NAFTA was passed and we saw huge influxes of immigration from, from primarily from Mexico, uh, their, grand, their children and their grandchildren will in a sense have a, will, will shape a new identity, will shape a new um, meaning of mestizaje, of, of to, what it is to be mixed race in this country. And uh, so George Zimmerman to me represents a very fascinating and very frightening experience of assimilation. That is really what is at the core of, of this for me, is that George Zimmerman bought into the American dream. He saw himself as, as a protector of private property and of wealth uh, and, of, uh, in, and in a way of, of whiteness and what that, how that is tied to uh, the, the opposition to blackness and to, to urban youth. Um, you know, the idea that somehow a hoodie is threatening um, or that a young man talking to his girlfriend on, the cell, on a cell phone is threatening is, is really part of the equation that, that um, when we talk about, about Trayvon Martin, I think the, uh, the, the piece about George Zimmerman is equally as fascinating. The other part that I found very fascinating is that I have brothers that resemble both of these. Um, and this is what this poem is about. It's called I Have a Brother. I have a brother who could be mistaken for Trayvon Martin, 18 and life to go, senior in high school but won't graduate. New tattoo on his neck says, you only live once. And I don't know why, but somehow this only, you only live once 
became very popular recently. So he got it tattooed on his neck. You only live once. Talks to his girl on the cell phone, wears hoodies on the regular, just as I did at 17, 18, and still do at 38. I wear a hoodie to the, to the gig tonight. My little bro is black and Mexican, so he fits the description. Coincidentally, my little bro even shares Trayvon's last name. And I know that could have been him lying in a puddle of his own blood, murdered for being in the wrong skin at the wrong place, wrong time. He fit the description of a dangerous threat to our post-racial sensibilities. At age 17, my little bro got busted for stealing wine from Walmart and got community service, a slap on the wrist. Trayvon Martin didn't steal anything, bought his Skittles and iced tea and got a death sentence a bullet in the chest. I have another brother, a year younger than me, who could be George Zimmerman. Like Zimmerman, we have one Latino parent, one white. Coincidentally, this brother shares the same last name as me. We were best friends growing up until we grew apart. He went off to Air Force Academy. I went off to college. He wanted to be an Air Force pilot, an FBI agent, a state trooper. I wanted to be a comic book artist, a football player, a revolutionary. He ended up a probation officer, now a jail commander. Loves God, country, family, obsesses over crime, carries a gun everywhere. On weekend nights, he listens to the police scanner, knows every juvenile delinquent in the city by name and case number. I ended up a bookstore worker, a soccer player, a community organizer. On weekend nights, I read poems about my brothers with the criminals, the delinquents, the dead. And I have a brother who could have been Trayvon Martin and another who could have been George Zimmerman and a recurring nightmare in which one brother is lying in a pool of his own blood, tea, and Skittles, while the other lies in the cell of a jail of which he is the commander, listening to my poetry broadcasts on a police scanner in a country that swallows them both. All right, this, so this is the poem that, that Lewis requested that I read. Uh, are there any music fans out there? Everybody laugh. All right, hey, before I, hey, let me say this. Before, if you like music, any hip-hop fans out there? All right, Twin Cities' best hip-hop artist is in the house tonight, Mr. Toki Wright. Toki, stand up. Hey, I'm not lying. This, this is the best rapper and, and the most real rapper. His, his stuff is very real. Check him out, tokiwright.com. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Two Psycho Lee and Brenda Song from Speakers of the Sun for coming out, Comandante Chucho, uh, Silvia and Israel from, let me see if I get this right, Comunidad Haranera de los Twin Cities, right? Lupe Castillo and, and Jessica Lopez Lyman, thank you all for coming out and supporting. I don't know. I don't know what's so funny about oh, it. <laughs> Rebecca, I'm sorry. Did I say Brenda? I'm sorry, Rebecca Song. <laughs> I apologize, Rebecca. I know your name, <laughs> Rebecca Song. Spe hey, speakers of the Sun, if they ever take the stage, check them out. Re Rebecca, I apologize. Um, Marvin Gaye. I remember the day Marvin Gaye died. I was I was only nine. I wasn't a Marvin Gaye fan, but. Um, I remember the, the day he died, and this is why. Every generation has its historical moments of collective grief and disbelief, moments we forever remember exactly where we were when. The deaths of Kennedy, King, Clemente. Hey, there's a Clemente reference right there. The space shuttle Challenger explosion when the planes hit the towers on 9-11. Some of these I was around for, some I was not, but I remember the day Marvin Gaye died. It was the day I saw my father cry. 
In 1984, I was halfway to manhood, living halfway between Motown and Michael Jackson's hometown. I knew nothing of Orwell's Big Brother, Reaganomics, Beirut, or the Conchas. My world consisted of playing guns with my brothers, a meager allowance, and the Dallas Cowboys. I was nine years old, almost 10 that April Fool's Day. My father and I seated side by side on the burgundy brick pattern couch, living room awash in the electric blue gray glow of the television. Father and son sharing a can of Pepsi as fathers and our sons are wont to do in the last remnants of a spring Sunday evening before it slips away into work and school. The talking head announces the shooting of a soul singer by his father in a furious fit on the day before his 45th birthday. My own father, barely 30, slumps back as if a bullet has struck him in the chest, puts his working man's hands to his music lover's ears as if by blocking out the messenger's voice he can make the message come undone. And I watch my father watch the newscaster, waiting for the whole thing to be called a ruse, an April Fool's Day prank, so we can laugh and say, that was a good one. They really had us fooled. But the punchline never comes. There is no rebuttal. The newscaster is on to the next story, and my father's face is a pamplona of tears. In 1984, Marvin's sexual healing may have been my father's soundtrack, but Michael Jackson's thriller was mine. If you can believe it, thriller is now 30 years old. <laughs> Makes me feel old. More than a decade would pass before I'd come to fully understand and appreciate Marvin's gift for music, his turbulent life, or my father's sense of loss that day, weeping for a man he never knew, but a soul whose troubles mirrored his own. So what's a boy to do when his father cries like a baby for the crimes of another son's father? He reaches out his nine-year-old arms brushes away the saltwater bulls running down his father's face, wraps his small arms around his father's necks and hugs him until, and should I someday be blessed with sons of my own, may they never be afraid to sing like Marvin, cry like their grandfather, and love as if eternally nine. Thank you for listening. A work in process. Divine Mother talking to you. They've been calling her Kali. Before I go into this, Bernice again. When Bernice was here, one of the things that she said to me that really grabbed me was, liberation isn't something far off into the future that it's something that's very present when you dare to do what you've been told not to do, that you've been threatened that you shouldn't do. Liberation is in each moment you decide to act against oppression. That's part of what's in this. Freedom ain't nothing but a word. If anything, it's actually a way of breathing. Being all right with the way things are. Good or bad, hot or cold, hungry or satiated, tin or gold. Hold on, cause nothing stays the same. Knowing that things are constantly changing, that's the game. It's moving toward a river called the Tao, the way things are in the way of nature, a way of being in harmony with the flow and the pulse of seasons. Each precious moment is full of potential, of infinite becoming. My mother taught me, encouraged me to keep unfolding, to keep flowing, though it frightened her she was always behind me. Though it often felt like hovering and controlling to me, 
She unintentionally or otherwise taught me how to rebel, thrive, and survive. Now I'm moving into a righteous season of ripening. I'm full of offerings for the possibility of newness, of freshness, and the flaming autumn of life. Yeah, I've been fearful of death, fearful of oppression, fearing loss of the sheltering home, fear of prison, fearing the loss of loved ones, fear of the fierce rebellion of Mother Earth against our foolishness, tearing down, deconstructing, rearranging, correcting, and balancing. Yeah, I've been fearful of my rebirth. In and out of body, fear of letting go, embracing the revelation of a new world. Fearing letting go of what I am used to, although I know what I am used to is of little use to me now. Yeah, the times there are changing, y'all. Find your relatives. Find your relatives, the ones you know about and those that have been invisible to you right before your eyes. Because of your belief about race, sex, class, gender, or species, recognizing the expansiveness and depth of who your relatives really are, animal, vegetable, mineral, spirit, Joy and wonder seek me as I seek them. The future approaches me and pulls me into its flesh, body, and soul. As one of my mothers said, we come to kiss where borders of nation, worlds, dimensions disappear. To hear you to touch you, to embrace you at last. Ancestral mother voices fill my ears, vibrate in my heart. Liberation is as available in every breathing moment. Become new men, become new Men, become new men. As the cosmos, as the cosmos dances within. Now that's liberation. Thank you for coming out. Please. My brother Leo Lara from Ecuador. And my fellow Midwesterner, Emmanuel Ortiz. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you for your attention. Th oh, oh, oh. If you have extra change or change you want to give or checks you want to write, in order to keep these events going and the publications rolling out, it would be really helpful if you would give us whatever you can, whatever you feel moved to. Thank you so much for coming out tonight.
Gracias, buenas noches.